Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Happy Friday. My name is Vernon Everett. I'm the Managing Director for Customers Communications and Technology at uh, Transport for Lon London, and it's my privilege to be chair today for this latest presentation in the Gender on the Agenda uh, series. And many thanks to Mott McDonald and the Urban Transport Group for sponsoring uh, this series. I, I'm also privileged to be a, um, a director of the Urban Transport Group uh, and know what wonderful work it does all the way around the country. So thank you to, to, to Mott's and to, and to UTG uh, as well. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the next hour um, uh, and we've got a hard stop at three at three o'clock uh, but we've got a stellar lineup of speakers uh, for you on uh, on this issue. Uh, we have uh, Professor Andre Woodcock who's the principal investigator for Tingo. Uh, we have uh, Sahar Dinesh Who's, uh, who leads for government engagement at, at BSI. And we've got Annie Redaway, who's the regional city manager uh, for, of uh, London Tier, who are, and that we can find no better lineup, frankly, for people to talk to us about how technology and innovation can, can support inclusive mobility, which is the real theme uh, of this session. So um, I, I'm going to make a few opening remarks in a second before I hand over to uh, to Andre. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. You, you are you are all muted. Uh, so please add any questions or comments or observations to the chat. And what we'll do, we'll we'll keep an eye on the chat so that after uh, the three presentations, each of about ten minutes, we'll come to Q and A and we'll draw from what you've put in the chat um uh to to facilitate the q and a uh, and i'll i'll allocate questions amongst uh, amongst our speakers uh so uh so please do that um and uh we, you know we'll make sure everybody's uh, we'll try and answer everybody's questions so um let me just make a few very short opening remarks before before i hand over to andre now you know the theme of of this presentation that technology and innovation and, and supporting inclusive mo mobility i don't think we can let uh things pass without reference to uh, one of the core um barriers perhaps but also opportunities uh, to making uh our transport networks and modes more inclusive is the is the issue of safety and security and at Transport for London, and I know, uh, you know, throughout the industry, our top priority is the personal safety and security uh, of all of our customers. Um, and our network is a low crime network, but obviously the whole nation has been shaken by the abhorrent events surrounding the, uh, the murders of Sarah Everard and Sabrina Nessa. And it's really shone a new light on safety and security, particularly for women and girls, and has posed some pretty searching questions for us uh, as an industry about how we how we respond to that. Uh, earlier this year at TFL, we set up a women's safety task uh, and finish group, uh, which uh, has really started to zero in on, on this particular question. Uh, and we've got a new campaign launching uh, next week to tackle sexual harassment. Um, uh, and we're doing that in collaboration with the Rail Delivery Group, the British Transport Police, the Met, uh, uh, and others uh, as well. Uh, and we're committed to challenging ourselves to make uh, further progress and, and fast progress in making all of our transport networks safe and secure, and for them to be perceived as safe and secure as well. Um, and as we're uh, recovering uh, from uh, from this pandemic, encouraging active travel and the use of public transport again is absolutely key. And safety and security again is at the heart uh, of all of that as well. And in London now, we're about 60% of normal ridership on the tube during the week, higher at weekends, 75% on the buses. Um, so we're recovering, but people need um, assurance about the safety, the cleanliness, the orderliness 
of the public transport network and we've introduced many more cycling facilities and walking facilities uh, for people uh, as well but um, it's particularly striking uh, through our research about the barriers that there are particularly for women in terms of participation in cycling uh, and just a couple of uh, stats I am concerned about harassment or intimidation as a barrier to cycling more. 54% of women in our survey agreed with that statement. And I'm concerned about unwanted attention. 50% uh, of women respondents said that that was a concern for them. So uh, this is a big deal and we have much work to do to make all of our networks uh, more, more accessible. So uh, we're, we're in for a lively hour then on uh, debating uh, all of that. So uh, let's get on to the presentations. And first up is Professor uh, Andre uh, Woodcock, Principal Investigator for Tingo. Over to you, Andre. Thank you. So can you see my slide? Can you just give a nod? Yep, yep, okay, very clear, thank you. very clear. Right, uh, that's good. OK, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this event today. Um, I am principal investigator of the Tingo project, which is a three year project funded by the European Union under the H2020 scheme. And what I'll be doing is showing how Tingo has actually been working on this. Um, I'm based at Coventry University, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, send them to me as well. I have worked on two other European projects as well on transport, looking at um, sustainable urban transport and local authorities, and also the passenger experience. So very quickly, and I must apologize for quite a few slides, but I have no memory. So the focus of the talk is saying something about Tingo and why I think it's important that we're here. What are the needs of groups experiencing transport poverty? how women are benefiting from new innovations. I must say, I don't have a lot of data. It's sort of top level stuff. Um, why are the needs of such groups still overlooked? And if there is a key question that I want you to think about from my uh, brief presentation, it is this. Why is no progress being made? And how will understanding these factors that are stopping um, a women's mobility from proceeding, how will they lead to more inclusive mobility and how will affecting change within the transport business ecosystem lead to inclusive mobility. And I'll follow with a set of resources. Um, I understand you have the slide decks anyway, so you'll be able to link into this. So I have a three year project which is just coming to an end. And our key concept is to create a paradigm shift in gender and diversity sensitive smart mobility. Smart mobility does not need to fall into the same traps as traditional forms of mobility and it already is in terms of the technology push and the male domination of the industry. What we're looking at is creating a sustainable shift to involve more women, more people with disability, to be more inclusive to move transport forward. And this paradigm shift isn't necessarily about new vehicles, new system, it's looking at the wider picture so we're looking at employment, education and mobility as well. I'm set up as a virtual Tingo observatory and we have partners in 10 European countries who we're using to gather information on women's mobility to look at um, providing beacons of engagement and engaging people with gender and diversity action plans. So that's how we're formed. So if we look at the needs of the groups suffering from transport poverty, and here we're addressing gender transport poverty, but transport poverty isn't just about gender. We're looking at disadvantaged groups and they present different needs in terms of access to education, work, healthcare, support systems and recreation. And as an ergonomist, for me, we're still talking about disadvantaged groups. They sh we shouldn't be talking about these groups anymore. And there's an old, um, People say, well, disadvantaged groups are hard to engage with. Well, come on, we've been trying to do this for 20, 30 years now. So why are they still disadvantaged and why is this progress so slow? And the key issues still seem to be around safety and security, cost, information, physical access and availability. 
We've created five Jingo indicators to measure smart mobility innovations. Um, so we can look at ways in which they've measured against effectiveness, attractiveness, affordability, sustainability, and inclusivity. Um, and we're involved in developing new products and new systems as well, which we can use these to measure against. But is innovation introducing new sources of transport poverty? What's happening in terms of performing social and economic impact assessment? We know this works well and is really key. Are we going to be seeing a digital divide between the technology enabled, those with ICT skills and those who have not? How is this going to actually affect what's going on? And also the early adopters. Are we still designing for the early adopters or have we moved on from that? In terms of also looking at social and economic impact assessment, in terms of mobility as a service, the local authorities are also worried about how they're going to manage this and who in, within the city is actually losing out to this. So um, everyone else is going to say much more about this than I am. So how is innovation alleviating gender transport poverty? So we're looking at safety and security across the whole journey. This means from the moment you set out from your front door, or maybe even before that when you're planning to arrive at your destination, it's just not what's happening within the stations and on board the transport. It's how safe are you feeling in the public realm? Do you have agency to actually control and make decisions over your own mobility? Obviously, we're getting better data collection now. And now, now, now is the time, you know, we've had anecdotal stories, but now we have the evidence to back this up. We're looking at mobility as a service, so smart ticketing, on-demand services, integrated services, better information, and obviously sustainable, accessible vehicles. And here you can see the gender uh, harassment tool that my project's developed and also some of the innovations that we're looking at making. So how is my project creating a paradigm shift in gender and diversity sensitive smart mobility? We've developed tools and methods to help local organisations, local authorities, um, operators to develop gender and diversity action plans as a starting point to addressing workforce diversity. We developed an evaluation tool for new innovations We've got a harassment reporting tool. We're using agent based modelling to get a better handle on the mobility needs of women and people from different groups as well. And looking at visual analysis, how is transport being portrayed within the media? What visions are being sold to people? We developed a free data sharing repository because sharing of data on which you can form intersectional analysis is key. We've developed guidelines for female entrepreneurs, policy notes, and an open innovation platform where we're encouraging designers to provide design provocations, early concept designs, which may or may not be right, but will actually get people talking and sharing their lived experience in new ways. So what are the barriers to understanding the needs of excluded and future users, the lack of gender and desegregated data, the lack of awareness of mobility patterns, where people are going if they're not the main commuter? the lack of analysis tools and the sharing of data, the lack of diversity in leadership and innovation, a real lack of empathy amongst the industry, workforce diversity and the IT push, and the wicked problem of gender equality. So what I've been doing is looking at employment, education, mobility, and looking at a macroergonomic approach. So what are the, and I'm sorry this is based around um, the research career, careers of women, but I can perform a similar analysis looking at where the mobility bar where the barriers are, and we're finding it's at the higher level, it's a social and cultural um, level where these barriers are starting to exist. So it's not about the design of vehicles themselves, it's a wider than that, and it needs a check, a very large change. So gender inequality stifles innovation, and we conducted a pan-European survey of female entrepreneurs and senior business leaders. Innovation doesn't take place in a vacuum and the transport sector is deeply biased and is unequal. So we've got systemic gender inequalities across all levels. So women's mobility needs aren't being met, they're not being understood. Women in the industry feel undervalued and devalued and they leave that industry. We have the Matilda effect in um, research, but also across the board. 
where women's efforts are belittled. They're not thought as highly as that of men. It's harder for women to gain seniority and control the agenda. And it's harder to gain funding and support for business startups. So looking at some of the things that the tales that our women were saying, this prejudice, skeptical and depreciative attitudes, misogynist language and behaviour from male colleagues, gender discrimination, gender pay gaps, hard to make progress within the career, internal bureaucracies relating to maternity leave, being part of a prevailing male working environment where you're the only woman at the table. And how can you still reconcile your professional and family life? Uh, and this is really difficult. And we've performed this study across our 10 countries. So it's not just those who have gender policies in place. It's across the board. Women struggle within the industry. And if they struggle in the industry, they can't be leaders. And we're missing out on their creativity and innovation. So thank you very much. And to conclude, I'll quote from Catherine Troutman. More women in the transport workforce means more talent, wider vision, enhanced innovation, and a more focused approach to gender requirements in access to transport and mobility, and improved responsiveness to the transport needs and preferences of women, including issues related to safety and security. In the slide deck, you will see some links to the material that we have been developing. Please have a look at it. It's all open source and we want people to discuss the issues that we've been raising so we can progress the conversation and this will live on after the lifetime of the project. So thank you very much for your attention. Andre, thank you so much for uh, that really thought provoking uh, presentation. And I took uh, from, from your presentation a really central challenge for all of us that work in the transport industry, which is why hasn't more progress been made? Um, and now that we know uh, what uh, what we do know, how can we rectify that uh, and really get on with things? And there's some really interesting comments in the chat already, Andre, um, stimulated by your by your comments. And we'll come back to those uh, when we come on to uh, our Q and A. So I'm delighted now to introduce uh, Sahar Danesh, uh, who leads on government engagement for BSI. Over to you, Sahar. Thank you, and and thank you, Andre, for the really interesting presentation um so i'm following up from from those really interesting points and talking a little bit about the role of standards in delivering this inclusivity that we're all striving for um, next slide please um, my name as i said is sahara dinesh i'm a chartered engineer and i've worked in public policy and advocacy for about 10 years um, previous to BSI, I was working at the IET in the Department for Transport. Um, and at BSI, really, my role is to advise government to use standards to support public policy um, and to help um, help uh, policymakers and stakeholders engage better with the standards making process. If you don't know, BSI is the UK's national standards body, and we we produce British standards and coordinate the UK expertise to European and international standards. Um, and really, we support a public function in making sure that we can bring together the correct stakeholders to facilitate the development of what good looks like. Next slide, please. So what is a standard? Um, so standards are developed through capturing multi-stakeholder consensus. Um, they're they're voluntary, but they provide confidence to businesses and consumers, innovators, and um, and all the different stakeholder groups that utilize standards. They are fundamental in enabling interoperability in emerging technology. They we cannot create a, a systematic emerging world without them, without standards underpinning them. And they are used by government to support regulation as well as obviously being used by business and by consumers um, so that they understand what they are getting. Um, and they help drive better behavior. So they're not necessarily there by law, they're voluntary, but the more that people use them, the more the behaviors change. And there is a focus to trying to create a, a direction of what good would look like in any area. 
But most importantly, these standards, the multi-stakeholder standards that we create are made by experts like you. They're made by central government, devolved governments, regulators, uh, by consumers, by business groups, by civil society. And we make sure that all stakeholders are at the table when we create these standards. Next slide, please. So why is multi-stakeholder consensus important? So it's interesting that Vernon was talking about cycling earlier in the, in the presentations. Um, so this is a picture from one of my colleagues who's a keen cyclist he found on Twitter. Um, and it's basically two perspectives on the same cycle path. Um, the perspective on the left is a male perspective. It's a smooth pavement, it's separate, it's shade, it's not too busy, it's perfect. The perspective on the right is a female perspective on exactly the same cycle path. It's got blind corners, there's no escape routes, too few users, it's not a good cycle route. And this is why multi-stakeholder consensus is, is important because different perspectives matter. Next slide, please. So these different perspectives, they underpin quite a lot of the technology that we're going to be creating and using as we speak. So inclusive technology does need inclusive standards that are to underpin it. So for instance, cycle routes, planning routes, they need to be well lit and considerate of women uh, who travel at night time whether it's pedestrianized routes or cycle routes, they all need to have those consideration of inclusivity. Um, vehicle design, there is definitely consideration for the female form, both in terms of safety, like things like seat, bag, seat belts and airbags, but also in accessibility. Data, we've, we've spoken a bit about data and Andre gave a really interesting presentation about this. It's a big area that needs inclusivity included in it. it. We need to make sure that we're, women are not invisible and their data has not disappeared in the process. And we need, especially when it comes to modeling and testing of transport, we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions and making the correct distinctions um, when we're using the data. Um, and as we go further towards autonomy, um, you, that we need to take additional considerations. There'll be less physical presence of operators and guards on public transport. Are we considering how this would impact passenger safety and the way that people use transport? So in, in summary, really, it being gender neutral isn't enough. We need to be gender responsive when we start looking at these inclusive standards. And next slide, please. And this is really why BSI has been supporting um, a UNEC um, initiative. It's a declaration for gender responsive standards and standards development. It's a call really to all the standards organizations out there to help shape standards that are gender responsive. Um, but it really to try and demonstrate commitment and leadership in global standards development community that we need to incorporate all these different multi-stakeholder perspectives in the direction of development of standards. Um, my colleague Stephanie Island has been the chair of the UNEC Gender Responsive Standards Initiative since 2020 and we have been making significant strides to try and incorporate as much of these thinkings in the standards that we're developing. Um, the UK is a very active member of ISO and IEC as part of the Joint Advisory Group on Gender Responsive because this is not just an issue in the UK, this is about international standards. This is about how the whole world looks at the way that we create what good looks like. Next slide, please. So, how do we develop gender responsive standards? Well, and since 2015, we've been trying to make, um, we've uh, building the standards making makers engagement and inclusion team. Um, and really an initiative to support greater quality diversity and inclusion within standards development, because we need proactive 
proactive. We need to be proactive to encourage more women to be in the room. But also, we need to recognize gender expertise. So just having women in the room may not be enough. There needs to be experts who understand and can be more responsive to the needs um, of women and the impact that emerging technology will have on their lives. Um, we need to question the data. We need to make sure that standards makers understand the data they're using and the biases that are based around it and interrogate some of the information that they're basing their decisions on. Um, we're working on a project that's been funded by Bayes um, around developing and understanding the role of data and data an analysis in developing inclusions, inclusive standards. Because we, as well as government, understand how important this is going to be. And we need to improve the process. We need to make sure that the right tools are available. We need to make it inviting for women to participate, make sure that they're equally enabled, but also make sure that the environments we're creating to shape these consensus is inclusive and inviting for women to participate. We've been working to try and get our website into a shape that and invite more women to come and participate. All of these elements really try um, are fundamental in us being able to engage with um, as many uh, stakeholders as possible. And that's that's my presentation. I think that's my last slide. Um, and yes, I'll hand over back to you, Vernon. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's so interesting. Um, you, you know, the role of standards and sharing um, sharing those so that we can all all reflect on it in our local context as well uh, and, and that sort of guidance uh, as to what might provide the core for some some actions is is so helpful I think um, to inform this debate thank you um, so next up um, is uh, Annie uh, Redaway who's the regional city manager uh, for London for Tier. and particular thanks to Annie for stepping right at the last minute when uh, when her colleague was un unavoidably unable to to make this presentation. So we're delighted to to welcome you, Annie, and over to you. Thank you very much. I'm actually still digesting that um, presentation, which was absolutely fantastic, and I learned a lot from it. So um, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Andre and Saha there. Um, and I'll try not to repeat too much. So. Um, Speaking from Tier Mobility, so I am the regional, one of the regional city managers for London at Tier Mobility, um, but I am also um, one of the co-founders of the London Hub for the Women in Mobility Network um, that came from Germany um, a couple of years ago. So I'll be speaking for the micro mobility perspective, but um, we'll also be able to bring that perspective later on. Um, I've just noticed a slight change in the format, so hopefully all the content from these slides um, has come. But obviously we're talking today a lot about um, a gender focus, but when we talk about inclusive mobility today, I'll be sticking with that focus. But of course, um, at TIA, we are looking not just at gender, but also disabilities um, and all sorts of um, ways we can be more inclusive in the design of our services. Um, for our customers, but also for members of the public who interact um, with our streets and our pavements. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. So, yeah, so, sorry about the formatting. Um, so, yeah, just a quick introduction to TA Mobility. Um, we're a multimodal micro mobility provider with the largest in Europe. Um, we founded in 2018. Um, we've got um, vehicles all around um, over 148 cities. This actually changes daily, so that's the latest figure that I have. Um, and our mission is to change mobility for good by electrifying the last mile. And in terms of the UK, uh, we are participating in trials uh, led by the DFT and TfL in York and in London. Um, York, it's actually almost our year anniversary. And we have bikes and scooters. And in London, we are we launched on the 7th of June alongside Dot and Lime in the trial. Um, and we also that's with e-scooters, but we are also looking to introduce other modes imminently. Um, so a lot of our data as a company is currently from scooters, um, but we are also um, able to add um, some insights into use of our e-bikes and our e-mopeds um, as we go. And I think I'll go into it a little bit more depth um, later, but what 
being involved in the trial means for our understanding of inclusivity of our service um, is actually quite exciting. Um, being both a new mode, um, relatively new globally and very new in the UK and um, definitely also kind of new, new to the streets of London. So um, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so just to give kind of a high level of understanding, I know that this, some of this has been gone into in previous sessions, but what we look at when we look at accessible mobility, so individual factors such as health, income and age um, and gender, I just realised missed off this slide when I wrote it, um, infrastructural factors, so the infrastructure, the time that you need, um, time it takes and the distance. But I think one of the really big factors that we're finding um, in the trials is the societal factors of in introducing a relatively new mode of transport. So what's the acceptance and the connotation? Who, who are these perceived as being for? So an e-scooter in particular, a relatively new, what do women of different ages and backgrounds perceive them as and who are they perceived for? Um, we find um, currently, sadly, there is still a gender split of them seeing more as used by younger men. But we are finding that kind of depending on the age that we look at in our data and the people that we survey, um, there is a much narrower gender split among younger users. So a lot of our work in the UK and in particular has been around safety, but also education around um, around what we do and around what these modes of transport can be used for. Um, next slide, please. And then in general, approaching increased mobility, this is quite a high level because we've been into this in previous presentations, but identifying and overcoming the barriers to access. So what is it that our users need? And in particular, in this context, what is it that, that women or people who identify as women need? What prevents them from using the service? What is it that they're actually looking for? What type of trips are they taking? So inclusivity of the scheme design and the infrastructure. So um, I'm sure we'll go into this more um, when we discuss, but it was in the news this morning um, that um, the, some of the more recent surveys, women in Merseyside were recently surveyed. They feel unsafe using public transport at night. So 54% of women um, said that. But interestingly, 42% of women also said they have issues with safety during the daytime. So what sort of trips are they taking and what, what is preventing them from traveling at night? Is that perception of safety? But what is it that's still giving so many women that feeling of lack of safety? And it was very important that Vernon said that at the beginning. Um, to prevent them from taking these services in the first place and how can we um, learn from that and how can we design our services to to kind of increase that perception of safety. Um, and also what are the types of trips that women are taking in comparison to, to men or what are their needs when they use these and this has already been mentioned um, but the importance of women in decision making for transport provision to make sure that we're influencing service design, hardware, technology, um, pricing, um, placing of, of parking. Um, it's important to have a diversity of viewpoints um, in understanding what it is that we need to provide for all of our users. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we are in a trial. So this has been, this is, I mean, very exciting in terms of introducing e-scooters to the UK market. Um, and it brings a lot of pros and cons as an operator. But one thing it has meant is that we are doing a lot of data collecting. Um, it's quite early days. Um, some trials in the country have been running for a year now. So the DFT has been collecting data from all trials around England will be releasing towards the end of next year some of that data but it means that we have been doing a lot as part of our commitment um, to participating in the trial but also um, as a company to understand from users and non-users um, by usage data surveys and research so looking into as I mentioned before barriers to access how we can improve service design 
um, questions around safety, how to improve. Um, and one of the reasons it's not just users that we're collecting this data from, but it's to understand who else we can be serving, but also how we can take into account other people's needs when we design our service. Um, so some examples here, who's using the service and why? What types of trips are needed? What gaps are there in existing transport provision? How can we help to meet those? Um, some of our most popular bays currently are around parking bays, sorry, because in the context of the UK trials, um, every trip has to start and end in a parking bay. But where can those go? Where should they be going um, to meet the needs of users? So right now, a lot of those bays are around transport hubs. They're very popular, but where can we put them in, say, residential areas to meet needs of other types of trips rather than commuting? Um, but then, of course, as we're within the um, requirements of the trial, Right now, you need to write. You need to have a driver's license to be able to ride a scooter. So, what's the impact of that? Women are much li less likely to have a driver's license than a man. Kind of, what is the impact of that? Um, and how can we adjust um, what we do moving forward? Um, one of our solutions is also introducing e-bikes, which has um, a different um, gender split typically in use. But obviously, we're working hard to make sure that the e-scooters themselves are also um, have less of the disparity in use. And next slide, please. So just briefly, um, some of the stuff that we are doing as a company um, to address gender equity. Um, a lot of these I've mentioned before in the first point, so the research into accessibility of service. So we look at a lot of these questions through a gender lens. So our internal research team, we're working with research partners. We've actually got a dedicated research into safety topics for women Women um, in London that will be announced shortly. Um, our trial data in the UK is fed back to the DFT. Within our organisation, we actually have Women of Tier, which is how I first found out about the company. Um, so that is a network for women within the company for mentorship. Um, any questions that we might have, um, dedicated podcasts, training sessions, um, and that's been um, kind of quite important to us as a company in growing female representation. I think lastly, I put this in quite a short bullet point, but we do a lot of education, safety and training events. So the picture on the right is from Berlin last year. Um, we weren't finding as many women using our e-moped service as men, kind of what could we do to try to um, get more women to, to use them or kind of remove the barriers from using them. So we had a day where we had dedicated female trainers in kind of a safe space for women to come along and try them out um, off the road. And we're also doing training sessions like this in London. We've been doing dedicated training sessions at weekends, the last couple of hours of our partner bike works. Um, and just going out into the community and engaging and trying to encourage um, listening and kind of giving more safe environments for women to try to try um, our vehicles. So yes, lots of, lots of things um, there. And I think that was it for me for slides. Um, but thank you very much and um, I look forward to discussing further. Thank you very much, uh, Annie. And yeah, you know, the, the work of TIA has really stimulated and, and, and other providers as, as well. Uh, I sound like the BBC, I don't know, I have to mention everybody, but uh, but the work the work of everybody has really stimulated a debate, hasn't it, uh, about micro, mi micro mobility uh, and, its, and its availability. And I was really struck by what you were saying, because it's come up in the chat quite a bit about the collection of data. So you've designed that in from the very beginning. So that they're so that we're gathering uh, really useful stuff, and I know as as part of the new mobility work at, at Urban Transport Group, we're sort of pulling all of this together, so that we can feed it back to the DFT um, as well. So that designing in of of, um, of data collection is 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 fabulous. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. Uh, could I invite all of our presenters to come back on camera now, please? because we'll move to uh, some uh, questions and answers. And there's been some really, uh, really interesting chat as, as you will have seen. So 
I'm just going to run through um, some of them to kick off. And I think, uh, Andre, if you wouldn't mind, if I could, if I could address this to you uh, first. Um, Bernard Fanning uh, asks, uh, Andre, are, are the findings for inequality stifling innovation only in the UK? Are there any examples in the world where inclusive design has led to a better uh, transport system? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'll take the first part. Um, the survey was conducted in 10 European countries and we found similar results from all of those countries. Um, where I can't name any specific examples, but I'm sure there are some around where, um, yeah, maybe Vienna in terms of looking at inclusive design, where there is gender equality um, within the framework of the local authority that is leading to safer and better transport systems. Um, so there are many examples on that. But yeah, the results on stifling innovation and entrepreneurship, we were getting the same results from all European countries, so the 10 European countries we surveyed, regardless of gender policy. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for, the, for your question, uh, Bernard. And I'll come back to your other question, uh, other question uh, in a second. Um, really interesting question uh, from Glenn, which I wonder if all the panelists wouldn't mind um, answering or, 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 or giving your reflections on. Are you optimistic about progress and can change happen more quickly than it's done? Um, up until now. Saha, do, do you have any any reflections on that question? Yeah, it's a really good question. I guess uh, I'm generally fairly optimistic. Um, I think I think the biggest challenge really is the pace of emerging technology being produced. And, you know, I think that the, you know, the speed that we're going towards creating innovation and creating new ideas based around possibly not great data, possibly not great um, sort of inclusivity, possibly not entirely um, sort of knowing the, the sort of the challenges that different groups might face is probably the biggest danger. I think because of the speed that we're just progressing and the transport systems changing. So I think optimistic because there is a wave of interest and awareness, but we need to speed it up as well to match the pace of technology. Thank you, Saha. A Annie, what do you think? Could you please repeat the question exactly as a Sorry, yeah, yeah, of the question? So, so uh, the question was, uh, when you look forward uh, over the next 10 years or so, are you optimistic that, that the change needed that we're talking about here will happen more quickly than it has in the past? That's a, yeah, that's a, a good question. I think before we came on, we were discussing the topic of why have some of these things not happened yet? How are we still having the same debates? And I'd like to be optimistic and say you've kind of got to a point where you almost feel like the change has to happen. I think COVID has provided a lot of change in the way that we use transport and the way that you perceive what is essential. I think thinking about what counts as an essential journey and how, for example, care trips weren't officially counted as an essential journey by a lot of transport operators previously. It's been a large part of the debate in the last couple of years about what essential work is and what an essential trip is. And I think a lot of the conversation has really moved on in that time. Um, the changes in infrastructure that happened last year for cycling, for example, um, we saw a 50% increase in women cycling in England in 2020. So I think I think there's been a lot of catalysts that have meant some things have to change. Um, we also mentioned um, some collective, let's just say rage about women's safety on transport in the last couple of months, which has been crazy. So it's a long answer. I think I'll just say hopefully yes. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. Um, Andre? Um, 
Yes, I suppose I am optimistic. I think there is a sea change in terms of social and cultural issues and awareness around this. Um, within the industry, it's still very saddening to see that women have such a hard time in employment. And in terms of our survey, and when we've done work with the transport operators and local authorities, they still do not see that gender is an issue. And we've had to spend a lot of time convincing them that gender is an important issue for them. Um, but I think we made so many gains during the lockdown and there were so many changes, but I, I think there is a slight shift, positive shift and reason to be optimistic as long as we don't go back again and we keep this momentum. But also, um, I must say one thing in terms of not just gender, if you look at um, ethnicity within the industry and disability, uh, general diversity issues, gender is just one part of a much bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this actually came out at, at Transport for London, where we, um, we, we've we held literally hundreds of listening sessions across the organisation over, over the past several months. It was stimulated in part by the murder of George Floyd, because it, it, it gave rise to so much uh, sort of introspection uh, and reflection uh, a, a, across our organisation. Um, but it also built out into all of those other areas that you mentioned, uh, Andre, and, and um, you know we're seeking to do our bit to 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 move move things forward. But actually providing the safe spaces to actually have these conversations in a confident way is 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 also just part of the part of the journey I think that we're all on, and to have the confidence to be able to do that. Um, I think uh, let's go on to uh, to the next question, um, and I think Sarah Jones's question, Sarah's from Public Health Wales, um, really goes to the heart of uh, cuts through to the heart of it. Are we overthinking the answer here? Is it design of services that is the problem? Um, who shall I start with? So, how do you have any any thoughts on Sarah's? question? I think that's a really good question because you know it is as you said we have been talking about this these issues for a really long time. Are we overthinking over analyzing it? I don't think so because it is really complicated. There's layers upon layers and layers of technology and social interactions and you know all these layers need to have inclusivity at the heart of them and so we need to start peeling them and making sure that you know the hidden infrastructure uh, under everything has inclusivity at the heart of it i mean you know i spoke about standards standards exist underpin everything but we don't really talk about them that much and they need to be inclusive they need to, you know they need to have inclusivity at the heart of them as well and you know once you start creating inclusivity in each of these multiple layers that frame a transport system um, then you can start impacting the change so I, I you know it it is it is quite complicated and that's probably why you know we are making it even more complicated. It seems like we're making it more complicated. Thanks, Aha. Annie, are we overcomplicating things? Is 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 designing this stuff in from the very beginning the answer? Well, I mean, the, yes, it is designing it in from the very beginning, but I think the issue is it hasn't been previously. And I think now we're we're trying to make up for things we've learned on the previously designed legacy systems. I feel maybe I'm looking at this too oversimplistically, but I mean the standards impact design and the 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 workforce designing it. Like if you don't have that diversity in the workforce, then you're not going to get something designed for for everyone. And I think a lot of our transport systems were designed for it's very again oversimplified to say but male commuters going into a city and without having collected an actual understanding of who 
uses that service. I can't remember, I, I was looking at earlier the stat of how many journeys are actually commuter journeys on the TFL network. It's actually much lower than you would think. C commuter journeys? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, by far and away, uh, the largest proportion of journeys are, are, for, le are for leisure. Yeah. Um, and and the, com the commute, something like 30% of journeys. Mm. Uh, and the rest of it is people going about other aspects of their lives. So, and you're right, I think you're, you know, you just made me think and reminded me how many billions of pounds have been invested in public transport over the years to solve a problem of an hour and a half in the morning mm. in terms of capacity uh, and all of that. And I, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned from, from, we've learned so much from the pandemic, but one of the things we've learned is is the spreading demand and using more effective use of the capacity that we have available to us now actually can be very effective mm. yeah uh, andre do you do you have um do you, do you have any reflections on the design question um not much um a national integrated transport system would be good and i think not looking at transport in isolation is key you know, the, the best way for a sustainable transport system is working from home, is not using transport. So we, can't, we, can't, we shouldn't just be looking at transport in isolation, I think. And yes. yeah, part of all, it also is the lack of empathy. Um, things are quite easy and some things are quite easy and cheap to fix in terms of the quality of service. Zero tolerance of harassment, empowering drivers, you know, getting people to be courteous to each other so they're quick some of them are quite quick wins yeah yeah that travel behavior thing is is yeah. is always coming across if you've never seen it have a look at our website and 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 um we've got a series of road journeys uh, accompanied by the zen driver uh and actually every now and again when i've been infuriated by something happening on the roads i just watch a couple of videos of the zen driver and he calms me down and it, and there's so much of it is about behavior um uh, as well as the physical transport as well okay I was let's thinking move. more in terms of sorry more in terms of the operators the bus drivers and you know, and sort of respecting the passengers and looking at the quality of care so the buses don't pull off before people have sat down and things yeah. like that. So, yeah, yeah. And, and absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Andre. Let, let's let's move on. Um, and Bernard Fanning asked a, another really interesting question right at the top. So I think it was during your presentation, Andre. But may, maybe I, um, you, you know, maybe again I could just get quick reflections from all of the panel members. Just wondering if there's any thoughts into how to make women feel safe on the streets as well as on transport. Um, the mayor's transport strategy includes walking every woman and some men I know feel unsafe on the streets, um, you know, particularly when it's getting dark. Um, uh, Annie, any thoughts on that one? I don't have a, I wish I had a full answer beyond, I mean, it's, as I said, a lot of this, a lot of this topic right now is quite, quite, um, raw for a lot a lot of women um i mean classic answers are things like lighting i mean uh, you can if we're bringing in the technology aspect um a lot of the routing services that people use such as google maps and city mapper um can they at night take into consideration safety of, of walking routes i remember a few years ago and i know i know to caveat this i know city map is working on it i know it's a complex question um, but a friend got got routed by city mapper at midnight through a tunnel through a park, which no way, no way was she going to do that. Um, so I mean, in terms of technology perspective, it's how to improve that that routing. But but really, it's why should women feel unsafe at all? Um, but yeah, it's a lot of different factors, really. Yeah, yeah, it's a deeply complex question. Mm -hmm. um, Andre. It's to, it's a societal problem as well, isn't it? Um, yeah. It's not just women who feel unsafe. So yeah. um, culture, behaviour change, 
as well as a little bit of design of safe, safer places and getting places more inhabited, better lighting, as Annie said. Yeah. OK, thank, thanks very much. So, uh, Saha, any, any, um, any reflections on that question? I know it's a, yeah, I know it's a big I, question. It is a big question, and I think Andre and Annie responded really well, and I would just say more women you know, involved in these decisions, where the roads go, where the, you know, where the lights go, where, how, how, you know, how the technology is being used, how, how it's being implemented, more female decision makers, really, and, and more of, more, more women, more voices in the room that these decisions are being made. Um, and, you know, that gender expertise that is required. So not necessarily just having a woman in the room, but a gender expert as well, who who can who really understands it and transfers that voice um, into these these really important decisions. Yeah. Well, actually, you've just touched on um, um, another really interesting point there, Sahar, uh, that was posed by Ruth Lopian of Move. What proactive measures? are you taking to involve different groups to be really gender responsive and so i think you've you you've you touched on that maybe um maybe if i could ask uh, on andre and annie for any reflections on that and then we probably are out of runway and we'll need to need to round up so um annie any views on that any more proactive measures we can take to make sure that we we're getting the right groups together so we can be really inclusive um, I actually think that I don't have quite the the right level of, of expertise to make an informed answer on that one um, in terms of getting the right people in the room. Um, co colleagues would be able to answer that one better than me, I'm afraid. I can get back to you. No problem. No, fair enough. Thanks very much. Andre, any, anything on, on that? Well, I think we're all trying to um, design more inclusive events where uh, more more citizens can actually take part in these. So there are many guidelines on this, looking at co-design and lived experience, but also from an educational point of view, trying to teach people in terms of empathy and really understanding what's going on and what the lived experience is. From a practical point of view, we have developed guidelines and gender and diversity action plans, and there's social and economic assessment tools that can be used at, um, an operational level for developing sustainable urban mobility plans and it's just integrating those and making sure that um, it's not just the cost factors that are taken into account the livability ones as well yeah thank you very much but um, we've got a couple of minutes to run so so maybe we should draw draw the q a to a conclusion thank you so much everybody for your contributions on the chat what we'll do, we'll make sure all of your contributions are harvested and I'll make sure. So Rebecca Fuller's on the on the call as well. Hi, Rebecca, who uh, is um, a fantastic leader at the Urban Transport Group and supports me uh, on the new mobility work stream uh, that we work together on across the country. So we'll make sure that we harvest all of your comments as well and take them into that forum as well so that we can reflect on them as part of that continuing work. Um, and I'd also um, just like to uh, uh, offer huge thanks to uh, Professor Andre Woodcock, Sahar Danesh and Annie Redaway for uh, fabulous and insightful presentations which have stimulated so much thought um, and comment. So uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all so much. And uh, we'll just round off again with renewed thanks uh, both uh, to um, Mott McDonald and the Urban Transport Group for arranging today uh, and uh, probably most importantly to you for joining uh, because without your interest uh, and really interesting comments and questions um, we, we, we won't make any progress so thank you so much for spending an hour of your Friday uh, joining us here on this so uh, thanks again and uh, we look forward to you joining us again for some future installments on on gender uh, on the agenda thanks everyone and have a wonderful weekend thank you very much thank you, thank you.